And uh, we're just thankful that each one of you all came out. Um, there's a couple of things I wanted to say real quick. Uh, first of all, I'm so thankful for many that have stepped up and helped me to put this together. But several years ago, there was a teacher at this school, and um, her name was Susan Hall. And I remember she called me one day and she said, Tell me, I just want to talk to you for a little while. We went and ate lunch. And she just shared what was on her heart and we started talking about how much we would love to see a revival at our school. And, um, you know, sometimes our timing's not God's timing. And that timing wasn't right. And yesterday, I stood up here and I thought, and Susan would have loved this. And uh, I texted one of our mutual friends, Carol Rickard. She's taught here and retired. And uh, she texted me last night. She's like, how did it go? How did it go? And I told her, I said, man, I said, it was so awesome. And I said, Susan would have loved this. And she said, Sally, she said, you know, it was in God's timing for it to be now. And she said, but I know that Susan's probably been talking to Jesus and reminded him, hey, there still needs to be revival at Monad at BCA. Yeah. So I'm just thankful that God works. And once again, I want you to know that it's not always on our time. Always, whenever things just don't turn out like you think they should, just wait because it's a coming. And the second thing I want to say is we, we kind of geared this to be a youth revival, and uh, I just want you to know, if you're an adult here, from the youngest to the oldest, it doesn't matter, and if you feel like God's pulling on your heart at any time of service, young or old, don't hesitate to say, or even let the devil tell you, this is a youth revival, it does not matter, 10 or 13 years ago, I went to church camp, and I was going as a counselor, and just to work, and I'm like so excited because I'm gonna be able to lead people, lead youth to Christ, and be an example for them. And guess what? I went, and one night we had our service, and I was like, next thing I know, I'm in the altar, and I'm rededicating my life because I had been saved when I was 15, and I just kind of straight away when I worked in college, and never really took the time to say, God. Please forgive me for all of that. And from that time on, man, I I love Jesus more and more every day. And so I'm just thankful that y'all are here. And I just ask that uh, you just take this opportunity because this tonight is a divine opportunity and a divine appointment by you all. So I'm thankful for that. I'm going to ask Pastor Jeremy Wilson. He's our pastor here at BCA. He's going to come up and pray, and then I will stand up and start worshiping. Good evening, everybody. I hope that you all showed up tonight expecting God to move, and that you, you showed up with a willing attitude, being willing to be led by the Spirit. Uh, if you would, please stand and bow your head with me, if you're able to, for the Lord in prayer. Dearly Father, we come before you tonight, Lord, and I'm so thankful for this opportunity that we have to be here tonight. Lord, I just pray for your anointing. I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon each and everything that's done and said tonight. Lord, we pray. The Holy Spirit would be here, and the Holy Spirit would have its way. Lord, we're thankful for you. We're thankful for uh, the love that you have for us, Lord. And I'm thankful for those who are here tonight, those who will be leading us in worship, and those who will be bringing the word tonight. Dear God, I pray for your anointing upon them. But Lord, I also pray for your anointing on each and every person here. Like Sally said, from the youngest to the oldest, Lord, help us to focus on you and our relationship with you. Lord, as we are gathered together for revival, if any of us need to change, or if any of us need to accept you and begin a relationship with your God, I pray for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that no one would leave tonight without knowing you as their personal Savior. And I pray, dear God, that this, this revival that's on the calendar wouldn't end tonight. Lord, that's right. We would keep it going in our heart, dear Heavenly Father, we would draw closer to you, that we would be your servants on fire for you, and the, the work would spread from here. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. 
much for this song right here. Is anybody thankful that a father owns both sides of the river?
So if you say, I've never asked Lord into my heart, I want to do that tonight. If that be you, slip up your hand right now. I see that hand. Anybody else? I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Okay, this hand's coming up here. Well, I'll ask you this also. Say, I have asked Lord in my heart at one time in my life, but I think I've walked away and I'm not serving Him like I know I ought to be serving Him. So if that's you, I want you to slip up your hand and say, I, I want to get my life back right with the Lord. I want to get back on that path right. I see that hand. I see that hand. Hands are going up all over the room. I'm just going to do this right here. Every one of you guys that raised your hand, even if you did not, you guys come down here. Someone will meet with you. Meet at these altars as we continue to sing and talk to the Lord right now. Altars are open. Come on.
This is where Sue's in the hall right here. somewhere else. We love when we get to stay places more than one night. We've been able to get to, to know folks in this community, and we get to travel around quite a bit and hear lots of different people sing and lead music, but these guys have taken it to another level. Can we just tell them thank you man, for you guys leading us tonight? Y'all are amazing. I'm going to do something a little different tonight. Normally when I just preach a passage, man, I preach one passage of scripture, just work my way through it. But I want to share something tonight that I wrestled all day with really what to share. And I feel like this is what the Lord put on my heart. And Caleb's going to come share here in a little bit toward the end of the message. Because what I want to do tonight is I want to, I want to set this up. And, I want to, and then I want to share four very brief stories, including Caleb, that will, uh, I think, really illustrate what I'm trying to say tonight. But how many of you believe, man, that Jesus Christ really came to save sinners? Yes, you believe that? All right. But how many of you also believe there's a real enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, right? So here's the thing, man. This is the reality. I heard a great quote one time. You might write this down by this famous preacher many, many years ago named Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And I love this quote. He said, consider how precious a soul must be. A soul. How, consider how precious a soul must be when both God and the devil are after it. Isn't that right? And you know, the soul is what? The soul is the place where we can know God. Human beings are the only people that have a soul. Trees and nature, as beautiful as it is, they, they don't have a soul. They can't repent of their sins and believe. Animals don't have a soul. They can't repent of their sins and believe. Humans are uniquely made by God. 
Why? God made us in His image. We're different than anything else in all of creation. Amen to that? Amen. God's created us to know Him, to worship Him, to love Him. But what happened? Man rebelled against God. And when that happened, man, that image was broken inside of us. And therefore, we try to restore that image in lots of different ways. People say, if I can meet the right person, make enough money, have the right job, do all these things, maybe I will be whole. Maybe I will be complete. I'm here to tell you that you will never be complete. That image of God will not be restored in you until you surrender your life to the one who made you, right? That's the deal. But here's the thing. We serve a real God, but it, it, and there is none like him, but there's also a real enemy. And I want to be clear. God and Satan are not equals, right? They don't have equal power. Only God has all power, right? Now, Satan has some power, but he doesn't have all power. Only God has all power. Satan doesn't know all things. He can't be everywhere at the same time. Only God can be that way. So I want you to think of this. Consider how precious a soul must be when both God and the devil are after it. So tonight, God's after your soul. If you don't know him, he wants to save you, redeem you. But Satan also is after you, and he wants to ruin and destroy your life. Now here's a thought. Isn't it crazy? Like, if you were to go to Walmart, I, I like to pick on Walmart because that's where a lot of people are, right? But if you were to go to Walmart and just walk up to a random person, especially in the Bible Belt, like where we all live, and you were to say, man, do you want to go to heaven when you die? Don't you think most people would say yes, right? They'd say yes. And if you were to say to them, well, hey, Jesus is the only way to heaven, I think a lot of people would probably say, yeah, I, you know, I, I believe in Jesus. But there's a difference between just believing these general things about Jesus, but then giving your life to Jesus, right? And so the truth of the matter is, is that imagine on stage here, imagine there are two doors. Everybody say two doors. Door number one leads to life and life everlasting. Door number two leads to death and destruction. And so if I were to walk out to you and say, hey, do you want to enter door number one or door number two? Unless you're crazy, everybody's going to say, I want door number one. So here's the thing. If this door leads to life and Jesus is the way to that life, why aren't people flocking into that door by the droves? The world that we live in, people are flocking over here to this door by the droves, right? Jesus said the way that leads to life is what? Narrow. And fewer on it. The way that leads to death is many. It is broad and many are on it. So this always makes me ask the question, how in the world can this be the way to life and Jesus be the only way and people aren't flocking to that door but instead running to a door of death? And here's why. Because there's a real enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And you know what Satan does? He takes door number two, a door of death. But here's what he does. He dresses it up as a door of life. Isn't that right? And Satan says this, if you enter my door, you can do whatever you want to do. He says, if you come through my door, you can live life on your terms. Nobody gets to tell you what to do. You can be the God of your own soul. So because we're all sinners, guess what we all do? We all enter that door. We take the bait. We go through the door and we think that what Satan offers is better than what God offers because Satan appeals to our flesh. And we think if we go through there, we're going to be happier. And what have we all discovered in this room? What have we all discovered? When we walk through that door, are you happier? No. Are you more content? No. Are you more free? No. You're actually in more bondage, in more slavery, and you're more depressed. All those things because you took the bait. And Satan says, I got you. But I got good news for you tonight. Ready for this? We serve a God who knew that we were all going to take the bait, every one of us. Because the Bible says we're all sinners. So we've all entered that door. But we serve a God who came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and guess what he did to the door of death? He kicked it down, and he goes into the door of death, and he rescues those people and brings them into the door of life. That's how powerful our God is. Amen to that? So when Jesus Christ came and lived and died, when he rose from the dead, he said, death and sin and hell don't have to have the final say on you. I get to have the final say. But here's the thing, how crazy would it be for somebody to go through the door of death, Jesus does all of this to save them, and here's what they say to him, nope, I prefer darkness over light, I prefer death over life, how crazy is that? Well the reality is, that's most of the world, most of the world says I'd rather do it 
my way. Now let me look at this. John 10. If you're John chapter 10, if you're there, say I'm there. there. Come on, if you're there, say I'm there. there. John chapter 10, verse 10 says what? The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That's Satan. But it says, I, Jesus, have come to give life. Everybody say life. life. And life more abundantly. Door number one is the door to life. And life more abundantly. Door number two, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Consider how precious a soul must be when both God and the devil are after. Let me prove this to you. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. The back of your New Testament. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. What I'm trying to show you tonight is God is after your soul, but so is the enemy. 1 Peter chapter 2. Hebrews, James, 1 Peter chapter 2. You know this chapter. Sorry, 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. So the, the thief, Satan, comes to steal. Everybody say steal. steal. Say kill. kill. Say destroy. destroy. Jesus comes to give life. Everybody say life. Life, life more abundantly. So door number one and door number two, you've got to make that choice. But look at 1 Peter 5 and look at verse number 8. If you're there, sound there. there. He says here, be, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to deliver. Is that what it says? Nope. Seeking someone to devour. So Satan is prowling around, even in this room tonight. All over this town, all over the surrounding towns, there's a real enemy seeking someone to, to devour. And what does he come to do? I love John 10.10 10 because it says the thief comes only, only to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, if you would, go to the, go to the Old Testament. Go back to the left and go to 2 Chronicles, okay? You got First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and then 2 Chronicles. Way back to the left. I only have one more scripture that I want to tell a few stories. Go to 2 Corinthians, the 2 Chronicles chapter 16. I love this verse. 2 Chronicles 16. So way back to the left. So John 10.10, 10, thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. 1 Peter 5 out. The, 5, 8. The enemy prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to, to devour. Satan has made his colors clear. But then John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, I come to give life, life more abundantly. Look at 2 Chronicles 16. And look at verse number 9. If you're there, say I'm there. there. 2 Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth to give strength to those whose heart is completely His. Amen to that? Amen. God's eyes, think about this for a minute, are going up and down every road tonight, every seat, and God can see into every heart. That's crazy, man. So when Jesus walked the earth, that was unbelievable. He would do that. He would often say, I see faith in you, or I see doubt in you, because he could see what's in our hearts, because he's God. So tonight, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the earth, up and down every row, and God knows if your heart belongs to him or not. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the earth to strongly support, strongly give strength to those whose heart is completely his. Now, one last passage. Go to Proverbs, right? Job, Psalms, and Proverbs. So here's the, this is the answer to the question I asked earlier. Why aren't people flocking to door number one, a door of life? Well, we know Satan's a great deceiver. So he dresses up a door of death as a door of life. He says, enter my door and you will live. But instead you go and you find more destruction. Here's why. Proverbs chapter 14, man, this is a strong verse. This is one you need to memorize. Proverbs 14, 12 says this. There is a way that seems, everybody say seems, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death and destruction. This is the thing, we all think we know what is right in our own eyes, isn't that right? We, if you're a parent and you have children, you get this, because your kids think they know better than you, isn't that right? So imagine it on a grander level, there's God, the perfect father, and we think we know better than he does. So the enemy has come to deceive us, to distract us, ultimately to destroy us. He dresses up this door as a door of life. And we think, you know what? That seems right to me. I'm going to do what I want to do. We enter that door only to find death and destruction. So tonight, here's the question for you and for me. Are, are we following Christ or are we following ourselves? Are we giving way to Christ? Or are we giving way to our sins? Let me tell you a few stories. My dad grew up on the streets of St. Louis, Missouri. My dad had nine stepfathers. He was, my dad was abused. He was beaten. He was neglected. 
Man, you got to hear him tell this story. My dad's written a book. It's called Rescued by the Cross. But my dad was in the worst possible situation. His mom was married nine different times, right? His real dad left him when he was two years old. My dad had a horrible upbringing, drugs, alcohol, all of the above. When my dad was nine years old, he tried to kill himself. My dad says he didn't want to die, but he was tired of hurting. But he continued to live. He was unsuccessful with that. He would often, they would sleep by the front door, him and his sister, and they would wait till his mom was showing up in the middle of the night. She was a, a raging drunk. And the minute they heard the door close, they, they would get up and they would run out the back door and go sleep somewhere else because they didn't want to get beaten and hurt by his mother. So my dad was 16 years old. Man, this is powerful. He had never been to church a day in his life. Can you imagine that? Never been inside a church. But a guy in school named Jeff invited my dad to church to an event like this. First time I remember in churches, he's had the big choir lofts, right? Well, that night they were having a big youth night. My dad's first night in church, all the youth were sitting in the choir. Isn't that funny? So he walks in, now he's joined the choir. There he is. He said the preacher was an angry preacher. He would say, you're all going to go to hell. And everybody would say, amen. He's like, I don't get this. This is weird, right? So my dad hears this guy. He said, he's preaching and all this stuff. But then the preacher turned. This was an ex-gang gang member who had given his life to Jesus. And gang, I want to make sure I emphasize that gang member who had given his life to Jesus. So he was radical. And, but he also talked about the love of God. My dad did not know love. And that night, this, this evangelist named Freddie Gage, Freddie said, no, I'm here to tell you about a God who loves you, who died you, who, who cared for you, and who can save you. My dad went forward that night and gave his life to Jesus. There was a music minister in that church that began to hear my dad's story. He took my dad in and raised him his last two years of high school. Incredible. My dad was discipled and mentored. My dad now travels this country sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. He's been doing it for 40 years. And I'm telling you what, he goes into schools and prisons and churches and all these places. And God is using him in an amazing way. See, the enemy was trying to destroy my dad's life. My dad should have been a drug addict or in prison or, in, or whatever it is. The next child monster. All those things that happened to him, that's who he should have been. But guess what? Jesus Christ changed his life. He's a different man because of it. Now, me, on the other hand, I grew up then in a good Christian home. I'm going to fall off the stage. I grew up in a good Christian home. And I'll tell you what, I, I grew up in San Antonio, Texas. My dad's an evangelist. My mom taught in the Christian school. I grew up in a school much like this, a little bit bigger. But I, had, so I was in a graduating class of about 85 in, in, the, in the Christian school. And so I grew up hearing about the Lord, went to Bible class, went to church, all those things. But like a lot of church kids, I turned and I ran from God. And I started doing things my way. Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way that seems right to man, right? So I began to do what seemed right to me. But here's the thing. I had some fear in my heart that I didn't like to tell anybody about. Because we don't often like for people to know the things that we struggle with. But when I was growing up as a kid, man, I hated being alone. I always wanted to be with my friends or be with the group. I hated being alone because I knew this. I knew that if I died, I was going to hell. I had never given my life to Jesus. When I got into middle school, I started doing some things I shouldn't be doing. My life was spiraling this way, downward, out of control. When I was 16 years old, my dad came to me. He said, hey, I'm preaching at a camp this summer. Your youth group's going to it. You're going to go. Man, I didn't want to go, but my dad's bigger than me. He could beat me up, so I said, I guess I'm going to go, right? So my dad forced me to go to this camp. I get on a big bus. I go all the way back to the end of the bus. So I took my best friend, Mike, with me. I was like, if I'm going to go to camp, I'm going to suffer. Mike, you're going to go too. So Mike and I go to the back of this bus. This big, we're getting ready to head to camp that summer. So I get to the back of the bus. This is no lie. This is no preacher embellishment. I got to the back of that bus, and I know how camp works. Man, you go to camp. You ever seen this? People get all emotional and all this kind of stuff, and then they come home, and they just live their life like there was no difference, right? We've all seen it. People get the emotional high, but then it doesn't. They're not living it. And I said, Mike, I said, don't. This is no lie. I said, don't let me do anything spiritual at camp this year. And so I took my hand out and we shook on it in the back of that bus. I said, don't let me do it. Don't let me get caught up. I said, let's get to camp and let's get back home with all of our lives. So we go to camp. First night of camp, my dad's preaching. And what do you think happens? A lot of people came forward, really, truly giving their life to Christ. But I sat in the back of that room and I was miserable. I was absolutely miserable. I watched people responding. I knew that I was lost. I knew that I did not have a relationship with God. But here's the thing. I, you know, I, I wasn't willing to admit that. So I go back to my cabin that night, and we're in our cabins, and 
Mike and I were juniors in high school, and so we decided to stay with the middle schoolers because we knew we could beat those kids up, right? And so we decided to go there. These little rooms didn't have any windows in there, so this it was a really dark kind of a place. There was no moonlight, no natural light, so here we are in this room, and I was laying in my bed, and I just started thinking about my life. I was really giving a thought to my life for the first time, and more importantly, I was thinking about, man, if I were to die, God, where, where would I be? And so I, I, I ended up getting a little bit emotional, and I fell asleep. I woke up in the middle of the night, and uh, I couldn't see anything. Have you ever been in a room so dark where you can't see your hand, right? You know how that goes? So you're waiting for your eyes to adjust. Well, when there's no light, they don't adjust. So I'm like looking around. I don't see anything. And I'm waving my hand in front of me. I'm trying to do anything I can to see something, but I can't see. This goes on for about 10 to 15 more minutes. And this will tell you that I was a good church kid, so I had some good Bible knowledge. And my mind immediately went to this guy in the Bible named Saul. Remember Saul? He was a persecutor of Christians, a hater of Jesus. But what did God do to get Saul's attention? What did he do to his eyes? He what? He blinded him. So I thought, oh my goodness, I've made this deal with Mike. No thanks. God's blinded me, right? And that's no lie, man. So I start really panicking. So I'm looking frantically for something to see. I don't even know why I did this, but I jump over in bed with my friend Mike. Not a cool thing to do. I jump over. I start waking Mike up, and I said, Mike, can you see me? Took him a minute, he comes, he says, no, I can't see you. And I thought, oh no, Mike's blind too, right? I mean, we both made this deal with God, now he's blinded us. Oh God, I'm so sorry. I get back over my bed, and I'm just sweating now, I'm panicking. Somebody got up to go to the bathroom, they turned on the light, I could see, and I start shouting, I can see, oh thank God I can see, right? I was never so glad to see the light, and hear somebody go, TT. But no matter what, that's what it was. I was so thankful to see the next morning, Mike wakes up, and we're walking to, to the tabernacle, and he says, Hey, were you in my bed last night? I was like, I don't know what you're talking about, man. No, 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 no. But truly, that day, that whole day, I'll never forget it. It was June 7th of 1993, 16 years old. I started thinking about my life for the first time, and I knew this, man. I was like, when I die, this is the thought, this is what God used to draw me. When I die, I'm not going to stand before my coach or my dad. Or my, you know, my friends or my girlfriend. I'm going to stand before a holy God. And man, I was not ready to meet him. And I knew it. That night, I went to the church service. I remember I was sitting down front. My dad's preaching. And you know how this is. These guys know. I mean, when your dad's in the ministry, I didn't want to disappoint my dad. I, I didn't want to go to him and say, Dad, I don't know the Lord. I was kind of embarrassed. I had all these thoughts and feelings. and But I knew that I needed to give my I felt like my rear was nailed to that chair. And a senior came over to me and said, he could see I was struggling. He said, man, do you want to go talk? We went to the back of that room. And that night as a 16-year-old, I knelt down and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you what, absolutely. That night, everything in my life changed. I mean, everything. It was crazy. My dad used to give me the Bible and say, read this. He'd give me devotional books and say, read this. I had no interest in the things of God. But I'm telling you what, when the Spirit of God invaded my life, the lights came on. All of a sudden, it was crazy. It was like the scales fell off. I couldn't read the Bible enough. I went into my room. I, got, I took a big tr a black trash sack and I went into my bedroom. I had alcohol hidden in my room as a 16-year-old. I had all kinds of other things hidden. I put it all in the sack, folded up, took it outside, and threw it away. I mean, I let God not only clean my heart, but clean my house. You know what I'm saying? And I got right with God. I got right with God. And I began to boldly live out my faith. I, I used to make fun of preachers. And then all of a sudden, I was like, I'll never be one of those. God began to call me to ministry. He has a sense of humor, right? And I found myself going to Oklahoma Baptist University. I met my wife and... The rest is history. Now, Caleb, you come up here for a minute. He's been chomping at the bit. Trust me. Sitting over there for Caleb is really, really difficult. Uh, but Caleb, then, he's got his own story. So that's my dad's story. That's a little bit of my story. But Caleb, this is your story, right? Yeah, um, something that was really speaking to me while I was sitting up there. Today, a lot of kids are expressing, and people are just like to this culture, to discover who they are. But honestly, this culture will feed you a ton of lies, and you'll get a false representation of who you are. But you got to understand first whose you are, and whenever you understand that, 
that will tell you who you are, and that will bring the inspiration to live a life you are called to live. Boom, Caleb, that was preach, man. Good work. That was good. Hey, I have like 45 minutes to sit over there. You're coming out of a fresh nap. I'm telling them the bitch. You're telling them the bitch. So Caleb, kind of like me, grew up in a Christian home. And when he went to a public school, but he was in church every time the doors were open. When Caleb was a child, I remember, we went to soccer. I used to coach his little soccer team, and we, we got ice cream after soccer practice one night. And Caleb prayed a prayer. I baptized him not long after that. And I would have said, man, I thought Caleb made it genuine. Every parent does the best they can with their kids, trying to help them understand. But Caleb does not believe that that was the night he really gave his life to the Lord. And we all know this, guys. You see it in church all the time. People make decisions as children, but then when they become teenagers or adults, they realize, I didn't really understand what I was doing. Right? They prayed some prayer, but they never really repented of their sins and put their whole faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so Caleb's been on this journey. So before the wreck, Caleb was on the varsity basketball team. And I mean, I'm telling you what. He was having a lot of pressure come at him as a sophomore. Yeah. There was a bad group of seniors that year, and they were pressuring you, right, Caleb? Yeah, well, honestly, this is a surprise. Everyone in the room. But I had never kissed a girl at the time. <laughs> they were pressuring me to go a lot farther than, than kiss a girl. Right. So I was feeling a lot of person what I should do yeah. and what I wanted to do. Right. And like... I mean, now I have kissed a girl, but that's beside the point. That's beside the point. Thank you, Caleb, for, for clarifying that. Well, I feel like I needed to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I remember Caleb came home from basketball practice one day as a saw. This is one month before his wreck. One month before the wreck. He came home from practice. He walks into the house and kind of throws his backpack down. And he was all in a bad mood. And I was like, man, what in the world is wrong with this kid? Well, I'll tell you what was wrong with me. I was a teenager. So, hormones. <laughs> so, I go back, I go back uh, to his bedroom. And I sit down with him. And I'm like, Caleb, what's happening? And, you know, we had a good with Caleb. And I've always been very close. And we sat down. And he starts talking to me about the pressure. And I, here's the thing. Caleb had been raised to do what was right. But he really wanted to do what was wrong. Yeah. He wanted to go into door number two, but he knew that he shouldn't do that. Now, Caleb did not have the Holy Spirit this time, so this was just kind of a conscience, moral conviction kind of a thing, which makes it even more hard. When you don't have God fighting your battles, you're a sunk ship. Isn't that right? And so Caleb was feeling that draw and that lure to the things of the world. Yeah, I just met a decision when I was, when I was younger. Pretty much because I was just a part of going to hell. So that's why the decision I made wasn't going to last. Because I know inward transformation yeah. in my life. Like, that's why when for this wreck happened, yeah. and I fully gave my life to Jesus yeah. more intimately, that's when the blinders really came off. I began to see this world so much differently. That's right. So people as a pastor, they often come to me. I have so many conversations with people about, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm a Christian and all this kind of thing. And I never ask them. I never say, hey, when were you baptized? Or when did you pray that prayer? I never do that. I always say this. When did you come to life spiritually? Right? When did you come to life spiritually? So in other words, when did your heart shift toward God and the things of God? And if they can't answer that question, uh, you know, then, then they probably don't have the Holy Spirit. Because if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God awakens you to himself and the things of God, right? He moves your heart toward him. And so, Caleb, what I, what I can say is that I don't, know, I don't know what happened to Caleb as a child. But I know this. At about eight months after the accident, when we were in Boise, Idaho, as you heard us say last night, that's when he prayed to receive Christ. And I can just tell you, the Spirit of God came inside of Caleb and has changed him radically in every pot. Now, he's still a sinner. You're still a sinner. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, of course, we're going to still struggle with that. But I'm telling you what, because we're all a sanctified work in progress, but Caleb has absolutely been transformed in the heart. Yeah, and the reason why I feel like I'm so different is because... I have the inward transformation right. in my life now. So, 
I can't help but live the way God tells me to live. That's right. And so Caleb, I mentioned this. Caleb is the most disciplined person in our family. He gets up first thing in the morning. I told you last night, he's memorized the book of Philippians. He starts out his day in worship. I mean, he gets on his knees, he throws those hands in the air, and he sings literally at the top of his lungs, even at 5 o'clock in the morning, okay? I often have to go in there and say, Caleb, sing in your head. Go back to bed. The rest of us are trying to sleep. What? <laughs> that's not the same at all. <laughs> Well, that's what I'm thinking. Well, I'm mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but Caleb, he seriously, he's a worshiper. We have three worship services in our church. For a while, Caleb was going at 8, 9, 30, and 11. But then he said, you know what? I need to go to Sunday school. So now he goes to church at 8, goes to Sunday school at 9, 30, and comes back at 11. He's like the greatest greeter in our, everybody loves Caleb. I mean, he's oh, there. Like, y'all guys know that Walmart greeter was a smiling face shit. Smile of his thinker. Yeah. Upper shame. That's right, man. Caleb is a champion, man. But I mean, at 8 o'clock, he is on his knees, hands lifted, worshiping God, ready to go. And so, this is, I want you to hear this. Why? Because, again, you heard me, you've heard us say this. He, he used to hate to sing before the wreck. Now he, he won't stop singing. But you sing with all of your heart. Why do you sing so expressively and so passionately? Well, because I remember a time recently. In my life, whenever I was trying to talk, but no words would come out. I would try to walk, but I couldn't physically do that. And doctors were telling me, you'll never speak again, you'll never walk again, you'll never do anything again. And now, God has restored all his abilities. And I feel like that wasn't so I could use them for my own selfish ambitions. But I feel like God has restored them. So I can use them for the things he would call me to do. And I love that because there was a time Caleb couldn't breathe. Well, God's given him his breath back. So what does the scripture say? Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. There was a time Caleb couldn't speak. God's given him his words back. What does the Bible tell us? Go and make disciples of all nations. Caleb's literally putting the Bible into effect in his life because the God that rescued him and saved him did not rescue and save him for him, but to be a light in this very dark world. And that's what we're getting to see God doing Caleb's life in really remarkable ways. I'm like, I don't feel like God rescued me to be shy and keep myself. Like I know I was very shy before the Lord, yeah. but I feel like God has rescued me to be bold and share with every person I come in contact to what he did for me and say, that's something God he can do for you too. Well, let me tell you this. I want to tell you, that's right. I want to tell you this last story and I want Caleb to step here. So hang on for a minute before you come play, okay? Just for a second. But, so Trey, our son Trey, and there's a long story here, guys, and I'm not pushing our book by any means, but I go through all of this in detail in, in the book. Our family has been a medical disaster. I mean, insurance lost a bet on our family, right? And I'm telling you, we've had so many challenges in our life. We have immune deficiency in our family. We've had bone marrow transplants, all different kinds of things. And uh, our two sons, have, Caleb was number two in the lineup. Our next two sons were born with a rare a disease called Severe Combined Immune Deficiency Syndrome. It's like that old school movie with John Travolta, The Boy in the Plastic Bubble. They did not have any immunities. I gave bone marrow to my son Clayton. He was in the hospital for seven months uh, when, when he was a baby. And then he lives a normal life. He's a freshman in college, called the ministry, loves Jesus. Our son Trey was born in 2006. My daughter was a perfect match sibling, very rare. So Trey, by all accounts medically, should have been healthier than his brother Clayton. Trey did not even need chemotherapy initially. Because when you give a perfect match bone marrow, there's usually this meshing of the cells and there's no fighting of those things. So when Trey was a little baby, he received a bone marrow transplant from my daughter, Brittany. And Trey lived a normal, healthy life for six years. When Trey was six years old, we were having a revival at our church. One night, Trey laid his head down in my wife's lap and he started running a fever. Well, Trey had gotten sick before every kid does, but this fever didn't go away. So at the time, we were seeing a doctor in Oklahoma City, and we took him to the doctor, and he ran all these tests, and he couldn't figure out what was going on. And one night at 11 p.m., my doctor called me, never a good sign. And he said, hey, 
the lab work has come back. There's something wrong in Trey's blood. You need to take him back down to Dallas, Texas, to his doctors there and have him look at the blood. What the doctor didn't want to tell us was it was cancer. These cells of my daughter's had begun to attack Trey's body. So we get back to Dallas, and they run all these tests, and they say, here's what Trey needs. He needs another transplant. They said, this time, though, we're going to give him chemotherapy. We're going to wipe out all the bad cells. We're going to give him Brittany's good cells, my daughter's cells, and hopefully those cells will grow inside of him. And, and just like anything, it, it'll work. So we prayed, and we believed, and we believed that's what God wanted us to do. Well, in December of 2012, Trey received chemotherapy as a little six-year-old. And it was tough, hard chemo. And we prayed and believed. My daughter donates bone marrow. She gives it to Trey. Well, the, everything was looking really good. The turn of the year came, 2013. Trey was doing really well. And uh, one night, January the 8th of 2013, I'll never forget this day until I see my son in glory again. Trey decided he wanted to go to bed early. My wife was with him, and they were in Dallas. I was in Newcastle, about Oklahoma City, with other kids. And my wife and I used to switch. We'd take turns. And uh, she was down with Trey, and I was there. Trey wanted to go to bed. So that night, Emily went over to lay down in the bed by the, by the window about 8 o'clock. Well, a couple hours later, Emily wakes up just to look over and check on Trey. And imagine a little six-year-old boy. He's got his hands behind his head, and he's just looking up at the ceiling with his eyes open. And Emily said, she said, Trey, are, are you okay? He said, yes, but can you come lay with me? So Emily came over and, and laid by Trey. And they start talking out of nowhere. And we never talked to Trey about death because we didn't want him to be afraid. He knew his situation was serious, but we didn't really talk about him with death. But we talked a lot about the Lord and all those things. And, and out of nowhere, Trey says, he said, Mom, he said, am I going to die? Man, it took Emily back. Like, Where's that coming from? And, she, and Emily said, well, Trey, no, you're not going to die until God's done with you on this earth. Well, out of nowhere, Trey said, but he said, but I'm not a Christian. You know, you're raised in a pastor's house, and you hear about the gospel all the time, and you're always teaching your kids about the Lord. So we knew that and Trey had this, he had an understanding of who Jesus was and what he had done. But that night, it was clear. He was thinking about death, and he was thinking about the fact that he didn't know the Lord. And Emily said, well, Trey, do you want to be a Christian? And he said, yes. So Emily walked my son through the gospel, as we had done many times. She said, Trey, you have to admit that you're a sinner. Do you believe you're a sinner? He said, yes, and they talked about that sin is anything that we say, think, or do that doesn't please God. She said, Trey, you have to ask Jesus to forgive you. Will you ask him to forgive you? He said, yes. She said, Trey, you have to believe that Jesus is the only one who can forgive your sin, that he came and he lived and he died and he rose again. Do you believe that about Jesus? And Trey said, yes. And then they got to the very end where he only said, the Bible says, Trey, that Jesus wants to be the Lord of your life. She said, do you know what that means? He said, no. Which tells you he was being honest, right? He wasn't just saying yes to say yes. She said, Trey, Jesus, like being him being the Lord is like Jesus being the boss of your life. And man, that was like a light bulb went off for that little six-year-old. He got that. He's like, yes. He goes, you're telling me that Jesus wants to tell me what to do. And we said, that's exactly what I'm telling you. He said, I want Jesus to be my boss. And that night, my little six-year-old son prayed, asked God to forgive him. And he said, Jesus, be the boss of my life. Well, my phone rang about 11 o'clock, startled me. I answered it, and Trey had this cute little raspy voice. would have been a great preacher, right? And he said, he said, I'm a Christian now. And I said, what? He goes, no, hi, no, hi, Dad. I'm a Christian now. And he shuffled the phone to Emily, and she told me the story. January the 8th is called Boss Day in the Freeman family. All of our kids were in number 18 for January the 8th. It's Boss Day. If you were to go to Trey's tombstone uh, in Newcastle, you would see that January the 8th, Trey made Jesus the boss of his life life. That night, Trey said, Jesus, be my boss. And guess what happened in Trey's heart? He went from death to life in his heart, right? So, for the next eight months, from January to August, Trey fought like a champion, guys, I'm telling you. His doctors called him Super Trey. Outside of his door, it said Super Trey. They couldn't believe the little boy did not complain. Trey only, Trey only complained one time, and it about crushed our hearts because he said, I want to go home at the very end of his journey. And I'm telling you what, we were all broken. We wanted Trey to be healed so bad. As a parent, when you can't help your kid, I beg God to give me the cancer. I beg God to let, to let Trey live and take me. All those things every parent would do. Hardest season of our life. And we beg God and we believe God could heal Trey. But from January to August, after Trey gave his life to Jesus, guess what? 
Trey became the most bold little seven-year-old because he turned seven in April. He became as bold as a lion, little uh, witness in that hospital, did he not, Caleb? Oh, yeah, for sure. I train with boldly, share Jesus with the with this atheist doctors and Jewish ones. Exactly. And it showed me like God can use anyone. Right. Even if you're shy by nature, God can change you and make you bold. Because right. I was very shy, so I was like, maybe Trey can just do that. It's more bold than I was. But I'm saying that God had different plans because when I have my right, when I got my energy, God totally changed me, transformed me, has made me bold, and he has me sharing Jesus boldly with everyone. So Trey's doctors would walk in the room, two Jewish doctors, two atheist doctors, and he would say, is Jesus your boss? How's that for a conversation starter, right? And I'm telling you what, we got to share Christ with these guys, and they watched Trey endure really faithfully. Uh, I like to say, first, Trey, my younger brother Trey, got to put my dad in a lot of awkward situations. But now, he has passed the baton, and it's my turn, so I get to put my dad in awkward conversations. Oh, thank you, Can I just say, it's fun. It's fun. Right, that's right. So that summer, summer of almost done, summer of 2013, my 80, in, in June, my 85-day-old nephew passed away. My wife's sister had a baby. He died of a lung complication. Two months later, in August, my wife's mom passed away after a long battle of cancer. And then there was Trey in the hospital during this whole time. Caleb broke his arm that summer. He was 12 years old. He was really sad because he wanted to play summer baseball. But that gave Caleb the time to be with his younger brother, Trey, in the hospital that whole summer. And Trey always wanted Caleb around. And Caleb got to watch firsthand his younger brother suffer well and share Jesus well. Little did Caleb know that four years later, four years after that, Caleb would be undergoing the biggest trial of his life. And he would reflect back on his younger brother. And Caleb would say that Trey has given him great inspiration to endure the trial he's enduring right now. Oh, for sure. Like, I got to watch a sort be super bold in his faith and how he would endure, endure the trials that he's gone through. It showed me, even when the stuff's really difficult, as believers, we're called to never give up, never give in, and never let go. Because if we endure our trials again, Jesus can be shown through our trials. That's right. I'm going to wrap up. Yeah, thank you. So, the, uh, so yeah, if you want to come play, there she comes. She knew it. She felt it. Um, I'm going to wrap this thing up. So, I want to bring this together for us all. So, fast forward. August of 2013. My wife and I walk in the hospital room that day. We had seen Trey in a lot of difficult situations. He'd been in the pediatric ICU many times with the chemo and all those things. But every time he rallied, he always rallied. And so we always believed that God was going to heal Trey. And we asked God to heal Trey, to take that cancer away. But in August, it became clear that the Lord was doing something different, that God was going to heal Trey in heaven. And we walk into his room, and I took one look at Trey, and I knew. I was like, man, he's done. He, his body had, was getting away to the cancer. He needed a new body. He already had a new heart, thanks be to Jesus, but he needed a new body. So I called back to Oklahoma. My wife and I happened to be in, in uh, Dallas when all this was really happening. So we called back home to, to Oklahoma, and I, I, I got my neighbor on the phone. I said, I need you to go next door, get my kids, and bring them to Dallas immediately. So she loads them up, and they come down to Dallas. They got there at about maybe 9 or 10 o'clock that morning, and we're all gathered around Trey. Now, keep in mind, this is the same room. Eight months later, he had just given his life to Jesus in. He gave his life to Christ, went from death to life in his heart on January the 8th. Here we are, September the 1st, 2013. We're all gathered around Trey, and Trey, even though he was physically, he was physically spent, his mind was still there. It was really weird for, for me to see. He was so gone physically, but he was still there mentally. And um, we're all gathered around. We're reading scripture. We're praying. We're singing. Just begging God to heal. And Trey knows that this is a serious moment. He's a sharp kid. And out of nowhere, guys, in that same bed, the same bed, 
We're all gathered around. He says, am I going to die? And I'm telling you what, I'm a pastor. I've been with people in their worst moment, in their dying moments. I've been there. I've held their hand and they've stepped into eternity. But when it's your son, it's different. And there's no amount of seminary or training that prepares you for that moment. I get on my knees and I'm just weeping on the ground in this hospital room, broken before God. But my wife sits right there next to Trey. And God so spoke through her. I'll never forget this as long as I live. Emily said, Trey, she said, you're not about to die. She said, you're about to really live. And that's the truth of the gospel. Jesus said, I am the resurrection of the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. The Christian goes from this life to eternal life. So when you walk through the door of life, you just keep walking into life until you get to glory. Amen? And that, about 20 minutes later, Trey stepped into eternity. The hardest day of my life. We say that our worst day was Trey's best day. Because he's with Jesus. Trey's not sad. He's got a new body. He's chilling with the Lord. I can't wait to get there. And I'll get to see him. Next time I see him, it's going to be for all of eternity. And then Caleb has his accident four years later. We've been on this journey of healing and, you know, hope and all these things these last few years. And so we're traveling because we want people to know this. Listen to me. This life is hard, right? Is it hard? Yeah. Cancer happens and disease and disaster and tragedy. All these things happen. Every ounce of suffering is to remind you and me we are not meant to live on this earth forever. We're not meant to. You can either suffer with God or suffer without him, right? People say, oh, if God's so good and God's so loving. Why does he allow suffering into this world? Suffering is here because of sin. God is so good and God is so loving because he did something about our suffering. Jesus Christ came, lived, died, and rose so that our suffering doesn't have to have the final say. Trace cancer didn't win. Jesus won. Caleb's brain injury doesn't win. Jesus wins. You may suffer immensely in this life. That does not mean that God is not good. He is so good. He came and redefined your suffering when he died on the cross and rose again. If you believe in him, if you'll trust in him, things may not go the way you want. They're always going to go the way he wants it because he's going to get glory. And you get to be on a road with him saying, God, I trust you no matter what. I tell my kids all the time, kids, life is not, life is often not good, but God is always good. And you can always trust him. He's the one constant in this life. You can trust Jesus in death, and you can trust Him in life, and you can trust Him in everything in between. I wonder tonight, I wonder tonight, have you entered the door of life through Jesus Christ? Or have you taken the bait and listened to the voice of the enemy and said, you know what, I'd rather do things my way. And you go through a door of death, described, uh, 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 designed as a door of life, and you're disguised that way, and you go through, and you realize on the other side, that's not what I thought it was going to be. So you find yourself in bondage and in slavery to sin. Well, I've got good news. There is hope for you. Because Jesus Christ came to set the captive free. And he, he can set you free tonight if you will trust in him. Can we bow our head together and close our eyes just for a moment? Man, would you just... I, I, don't, I feel like God is really speaking in this place tonight. I wonder tonight. Anybody here that would say, Pastor Jeremy... And I've walked through the door of life. Jesus is my boss. He's the Lord of my life. If you, and about 15 of you are going to get to raise your hand for the first time because you prayed last night. You say, Pastor, I've walked through the door of life. Jesus is my boss. If you know that, would you just slip your hand up? If Jesus is the boss of your life, slip your hand up right and see it. All right, you can put that hand down. I wonder tonight, just like last night, anybody here would say, Pastor, I've walked through the door of death and I'm in bondage. I'm in bondage to my sin, to fear. I've never been set free. Jesus is not the boss of my life. Would you pray with me? If you say, Pastor, that's me. Be honest. Would you slip your hand up real high where I can see it? That's you. Slip it up real high where I can see it. Jesus is not the boss of my life. Put it up real high. Okay. You can put that hand down. Here's what I'd like to do tonight. You are one step away from saying, Jesus, change me. And guess what? He will. He will kick down that door. He will pick you up. 
He will bring you out of your bondage and he will set you free in Jesus' name. And you can do that tonight. If you would like to be forgiven of your sin, have freedom in Jesus Christ in a real relationship with God, I want you to pray with me right now. There's no prayer in the world that saves you. I've said this every time. There's no magic words. It's what you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Tonight, if you would like to receive Jesus Christ and enter the door of life, I want you to pray with me. Right there, would you just say, Dear Jesus, God, I know I'm a sinner. God, I've sinned against you, and I'm sorry. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me. Forgive me for choosing the door of death. Jesus, I choose you. I choose life. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. And right now, I believe you're saving me. Jesus, please be the boss of my life. God, thank you. Thank you for loving me, dying for me, saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for being my boss. Tonight, if you prayed that prayer with me, if you just prayed that prayer, would you slip your hand up? Right. If you prayed the prayer with me, if you just prayed that prayer, I want to ask you to do something tonight. If you're raising your hand, if you're raising your hand, would you just stand to your feet? Just stand right up. That's you. Come on, you can do it. Just stand to your feet. If you just pray with me, if you just pray with me. I want you, if you're standing, everybody else keep your head bowed. If you're standing, would you look at me real quick? Man, I want you to know something. I've been where you're at. I've been there. I've sat there, and I know what it's like to be in bondage, but man, I know what it's like to be in freedom. And tonight, if you really gave your life to Jesus, your life will never, ever, ever be the same. He's with you. He'll never leave you. He's got you. So here's what I'd like you to do. If you're one of our pastors, if you guys could come forward real quick, any of our pastors that can help us counsel, if you guys could come forward tonight, we just need some help. If you're standing, would you guys come forward tonight? Would you walk down here? We just want to get your information, pray with you, encourage you. Would you? I'm going to have Caleb come down there and just encourage you. And pastors, would you just come surround them? And I tell you what, man, why don't you just walk them right over here to this side again? Let's get down. So for Caleb, you can get almost to hug your neck as well. We just need you to counsel. If, you're, if your head is bowed, could we just give God praise for a minute? Would you clap your hands with me and just say, God, thank you for the salvation that you're bringing tonight. We'll give God praise for that. If you could help us counsel, that would be so good. If you needed to stand and didn't stand, maybe you'd go over there at any point and say, I need Jesus. Our last thing, he said, Pastor, with your head bowed just for a minute. Maybe this is you. You said, Pastor, I am a Christian. Oh, man, I've walked through the door of life. But along the way, I picked up some of those old habits, those deeds of darkness, those things that, that don't need to be in my life. You remember Lazarus? When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he said, Lazarus, come out of that tomb. And what was the first thing he said? Take those grave clothes off of him because he's alive. There's a lot of you that are alive, but you're wearing some old grave clothes. And tonight you need to lay those things down. You know why he said take the grave clothes off? Because grave clothes are for the dead. And so many of us claim to be alive, but we're wrapped up in the deeds of darkness. And tonight you need to lay that down. And God knows. He knows what's in your heart. He knows what's in your life. These altars in a minute are going to be open. Here's what you can do. If you will come and lay that sin down, Jesus will forgive you. He will take it from you and he will set you free. But you got to come. You got to come. Anybody here say, Pastor, that's me. I've got some old grave clothes in my life that I need to lay down. If that's you, would you slip your hand up tonight and say, Pastor, that's me. Old grave clothes that need to get down. I see that hand. I see lots of those hands. Maybe tonight, last thing, you can put those hands down. Anybody here say, Pastor, man, I've got some heavy burdens in my life. Maybe you're burdened over a loved one, a family member, just some burden in your life and you're saying, Pastor, I need to lay that down. If that's you, if you're carrying some burdens tonight and need prayer, would you slip your hand up? I can see it. And so many of us, I'm raising my hand with you. You're one step away from freedom. You're one step away. Just take that step toward Jesus and I'm going to pray for us. As these brothers and sisters lead us, this altar is open. Would you come get on your knees before God, lay the sin down, lay the burden down, and find freedom in Jesus' name. God, we love you. We praise you. Thank you for the good work you're doing in this place tonight. 
God, let us not leave here until we've done business with you, Jesus. We give you praise in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together. Would you come? Can we get on our knees before God? Can we have some revival tonight? Lay down the sin. Lay down the burden. Say, Jesus, it's yours. And let's worship him. You come. Let's worship God tonight. Be responsible. I love saying nothing else. I tell my church all the time, I think we can sing this at the end of every invitation. Because that's such a great prayer. God, I'm sorry for going through the motions. We're all guilty of that. I'm sorry when I, I said you're not enough. God, I'm sorry. And the good thing about our God is that he doesn't stand over us in judgment and condemnation. He stands over us in love and forgiveness. And if you'll just say, God, I release that to you. I'm sorry. He, it's incredible. It's supernatural. He comes to you and he changes your heart and life in a way that only he could. See, Satan lies to us. He wants us to live in bondage, but Jesus wants us to live in freedom, right? So I just want to say, God, there's nothing else we desire. And Caleb and I, even though we move on, we're going to pray for this the school in this town. Because I believe God's doing the work. Don't you believe that in this area? Man, there are people, there are people tonight in the dead and all around that have taken the bait. They're in the door of darkness. You are a part of the kingdom of light. And when you go out of this place, you got to live your faith in a world that's trapped in the darkness. Oh man, I love the mountaintops. I love these moments. But you got to take what God does here and you got to live it out down here, right? If you, if you don't take what God does here and live it out down there, then it doesn't matter. God wants us to take what we experience on the mountaintop and apply it into the valleys of our life. And I don't know what the valley looks like for you. I've got challenges. I'm going through my own life. So do you. But our God is faithful. He is big. He is almighty. And so I want us to declare, God, there is nothing else that we need in this life than you. God, we need you and nothing else. Can we sing that together? God, you is what we want. Let's make this a prayer. From the heart, worship you. I'm sorry. When I've just gone through the motions, I'm sorry. When I just sang another song to take me back to where we start, I open my heart to you. Sorry, I'm sorry. Let's sing this, I'm caught up. Cause I'm caught up in your presence. I just wanna sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. And I never want to leave. Oh, I
do not leave here tonight unless you know you have a right relationship with Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus is coming back very soon. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. It doesn't matter what the interests or activities are or the things that you pursue. The number one thing is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Make sure you are right with him. I'm so thankful for uh, the Freemans and coming and doing the, the, the preaching tonight. It was great. And the worship tonight was great. Thank you all for coming to do that. Um, if you're willing and able, please stand. We will be dismissed prayer. Dearly, Father, it's been so good to be in your presence tonight, Lord. We're thankful for the moving of the Holy Spirit. We're thankful for the ministry that was done here tonight. We're thankful, Lord, for the opportunity that people have had to make the right decision to accept you as the Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that the revival does not end here tonight. I pray that each and every one of us is on fire for you and then we go. We like that. The scripture tells us in Matthew to let our light so shine before others. Dear God, help us to spread the gospel message. Help each and every one of us, Lord, to have a right relationship with you. And Lord, if there's anybody here tonight that's still wavering, they didn't make the commitment, Lord, but is still wavering.